We as humans have always been interested in the unknown, the mysterious, things that can bring us new experiences, uncharted territories, places left up to the imagination. Historically, humanity has ventured into the unknown often because there's the potential for treasure, or at a deeper level, opportunities. But where did this idea come from? Hero myths often portray the idea of a goal, of treasure that can be found if you're bold enough to leave your comfort zone. And yet, on the surface, it doesn't make any sense. Why leave the safety of what you know for the danger of what you don't? Especially because it's not like finding opportunities is guaranteed. And yet, it's a theme that continues to be portrayed. From Greek mythology and Homer's epic to the legend of Zelda and Link's quest for the Triforce, going into the unknown is mandatory. To question the hero's journey is to go against millions of years of mythic wisdom. The traditional role of the unknown is to serve as the adventure's core, to act as the catalyst of the hero's transformation, where wisdom, growth, and ultimately the goal are obtained. But while what is unknown is dependent on perspective or experience, the allure behind it is not. Instead, it's surprisingly universal. Curiosity likely evolved as a mechanism for pushing us to explore. It's why novelty is so interesting, why we're drawn to fantasies, and why our imagination needs to be engaged in order for us to find things interesting. But at the same time, the unknown is also universally feared. Because we don't know what to expect, there's just as much anxiety towards the unknown as there is intrigue. And this is a duality that I think is best exemplified through phobias. Phobias are strange. On one hand, something like thalassophobia taps into a deep, primal fear of what lies beneath the ocean's surface. But on the other, the deep sea is beautiful, it's captivating, it's something that people are drawn to exploring, or at the very least, learning about. And it is this tension that defines the unknown, a perfect blend of something that creates desire and something that invokes fear. Of course, how we respond is dependent on us and our unique temperament. So what might cause one person to salivate at the opportunity may cause another to shiver at the thought. Ultimately, it all comes down to perspective. Which is why hero myths come in so many different shapes and sizes, from the ignorant optimist, blissfully unaware of the danger they're getting themselves into, to the reluctant type, whose fear of the threats that lurk can turn into an extreme avoidance that holds them back. Each of these stories is relevant in its own way, serving as warnings of what not to do, or guides suggesting how we should respond. And it is here where I'd like to start. Mushaku Tensei is an anime about regret. It follows the story of Rudius, a 34-year-old, unemployed, uneducated neat who still lives with his parents. His whole life is one marred by the stain of failure, and while hiding in his room, he consciously feels the weight of unfulfilled potential. Due to his lack of courage, he lives in the shadows, very much like a hikukomori, until one day he's forced to confront his circumstances. Through a sudden spring of events, he's left homeless and without any family. As a result, he spends time aimlessly on the streets, with no care or concern for the direction his life is going in. That is, until one fateful day, when an event snaps him into action. A truck, moving recklessly, speeds towards a group of unsuspecting teenagers, and in the blink of an eye, Rudius finds himself confronted with a choice. Act, or do nothing. In the first moment of ever showcasing courage, he pushes the teenagers out of harm's way, a selfless act that marks a dramatic turn in his life an act of bravery that not only saves people, but also makes him feel something, for the first time, maybe ever. His sacrifice, however, comes with a cost. The truck hits him, and eventually, he dies as a result. Dark, I know. But it is here where the true story begins, as he is soon reborn into another world, but this time with the memories of his past life. Realizing he's been given a second chance and intimately understanding what the pain of unfulfilled potential feels like, he vows to take action and not let his fears hold him back, which ultimately sets him on his journey toward redemption. This story, as rough as it may seem, echoes a deep-rooted motif found across the world, the universal instinct for self-discovery. Stories often embody elements of the human experience that we all feel, that's why we can intuitively understand them, and the hero archetype is no exception. But while the archetype itself embodies the process of transformation, how we ourselves respond to the call for transformation can vary greatly. Rodius is an example of what we can call the reluctant hero, a character whose fear of the unknown outweighs his desire for growth. 
And because of that, he remained stagnant, stuck at the beginning of his journey, with the trade-off for his comfort being a deep unfulfillment. This isn't a plot point, but rather a reflection of a common human response to the unknown. Negativity bias is a tendency for negative emotions to affect us more than positive ones. Loss aversion is the primary reason for this. And in many different fields, research has shown that the cost of a loss outweighs the benefit of a gain. I mean, losing your arm would affect your chances of survival much more than finding your next meal. So what would happen then if we continually give in to our negative emotions, if we let fear or avoidance dictate our decisions? The dopaminergic system works through reinforcement and ingrains the behaviors that not only bring us joy, but also the ones that alleviate stress. And negative emotions are well known to induce a stress response. So anytime we avoid something that is causing negative emotions to bubble up to the surface, the actions will release a little bit of dopamine, reinforcing the avoidance that created this fleeting moment of relief. This is how we can fall into the trap of choosing comfortable suffering over uncomfortable growth. Of course, when this happens, we're quite literally sacrificing our future happiness for our current comfort. Unfortunately, a very common response to the unknown. Hero myths are legends born out of wisdom, wisdom of common human conditions and pitfalls we can fall into. The reluctant hero is an example of this, showcasing how avoidance of the unknown, of the call to adventure, can lead to a permanent dissatisfaction, a dissatisfaction that will remain until we answer the call to adventure. If the myth of the reluctant hero can serve as a warning of what happens when we avoid the unknown, the myth of the tragic hero can showcase what happens when we have too much conviction in how we confront the unknown. And Wander from Shadow of the Colossus is probably the best example of this. Like many of us, he has noble intentions, beginning his journey with the goal of resurrecting a loved one who has since passed. But if you play the game, immediately you'll realize something is wrong. For starters, the landscape is completely dead, haunted by a few remaining life forms in the shape of the Colossi, who when you defeat, act almost as if they're begging for their lives, like a scared animal that just wants to be left alone. Of course, to progress, you have to finish them off. But when you do, it's not like you're struck with a sense of accomplishment, instead you feel sad, kind of like you're in the wrong. At least that's how I felt. Ultimately, Wander's downfall is driven by his desperation. He's so obsessed with his goal that he tricks himself into thinking he can outsmart forces far beyond his understanding. And as the game progresses, his physical appearance begins to deteriorate, showcasing the moral and spiritual corruption taking place within him. A point I haven't seen many people discuss is that the unknown is not just a physical space. Sometimes what can be considered the unknown is part of ourselves. And I think the journey of the tragic hero represents this. Usually these stories portray a battle. A battle between the ego, where the parts of ourselves we are conscious of, and the self, which represents the unknown aspects of our psyche that try to push us towards self-realization. In this conflict, the ego fights to maintain control, doing so by clinging to familiar narratives, seeking stability, and resisting anything that can threaten its carefully crafted image. The self, on the other hand, can be thought of as your potential. It's who you could be or what you could one day accomplish. And because of that, it's dependent on the unknown, which challenges previously held narratives and gives us the possibility for growth. But only if we can overcome the ego. In these myths, the tragic hero serves as a cautionary tale, one that showcases what happens when we let the ego win. As opposed to the reluctant archetype, whose fear acts as a barrier to growth, the tragic hero has the opposite problem. Their certainty distorts their understanding and creates a desire to dominate the unknown rather than understand it. And because of that, the ego will still drive the hero forward, but as it does, the self will be unable to integrate, ultimately resulting in the downfall of this individual. So, instead of the journey acting as a catalyst for growth, it becomes a descent into chaos. In the end, both of these modes of living will lead us to the same place, a place of suffering. In order for us to find meaning, we have to self-realize, we have to unlock our potential. This can only be achieved by confronting and then integrating the unknown aspects of ourselves. And this is what the myth of the anti-hero is trying to convey. Among all the different heroic portrayals across the various forms of media, the anti-hero is by far the most realistic, and is a myth about a character who either lacks a specific quality or struggles with a conflict of interest. The arc of such a character is usually quite straightforward. 
the individual begins with a flawed or villainous nature that through the challenges of their journey gets overcome and eventually results in a redemption. Fittingly, the game Hades, named after the Greek god of the underworld, captures this myth beautifully. In the game, you play as Zagreus, the son of Hades, whose journey begins due to a raging desire to escape the underworld. Initially, his motivation is rooted in the spite he has toward his father, whose actions he just can't seem to understand. But as he attempts to escape, he learns more about himself, his family, and eventually, why his father is the way he is. Ultimately, culminating in a mending of familial bonds. While Hades is definitely not one of those basic, you know, good versus evil games, it is a game that explores the inner workings of one's motivations. Zagreus is by no means a noble hero. He's a person with a deeply flawed character, struggling with impulsiveness, being judgmental, and a very quick temper. But as he builds new relationships and overcomes different obstacles, he doesn't run away, nor does he blind himself. Instead, he faces his weaknesses, over time managing to turn his life around. The journey of the anti-hero is essentially the antithesis to that of the tragic hero, and follows a completely inverted arc. While one is considered villainous, the other is considered noble. While one myth has a redemption, the other has a fall from grace. So what is it that separates these two paths? It all boils down to how they interact with the ego. In our lives, I think the most recognizable way of being able to tell if you've had an encounter with the self is by how painful it feels. These moments won't just be uncomfortable, they'll feel like a defeat. And that's because the ego is a carefully constructed narrative of who we are. So when we're forced to acknowledge aspects of ourselves that don't fit into this narrative, it will feel like a challenge. For the tragic hero, how they respond to this encounter is their undoing. Instead of undergoing the process of integration, they resist, deny, and ultimately double down on what they're used to, the ego, which will lead to an inevitable downfall. The anti-hero, however, is the opposite. While their initial journey is marked by a morally gray area, over time, they surrender and are willing to engage with the self. The pain that comes from this is what ultimately reshapes them and leads them to a redemption. At this point, I hope I've made it clear that fictional myths are often extensions of real human experiences and used almost like blueprints to either warn us through cautionary tales or guide us through victorious triumphs. But in doing so, I still haven't answered the question I posed at the beginning of this video. Where did this idea come from? What does it have to do with meaning? I do have a theory about this, but it's out there, so you've been warned. Ancestral conditions have continually forced us to be a species that moves. From the herbivores we once were, to the omnivores we are now. From hunting inland, to hunting on the coast. From being arboreal, to becoming bipedal. It seems like the only constant throughout the whole process of our evolutionary journey is our ability to move. Or more specifically, change our niche. Which means our niche is not necessarily tied to any specific trait, but is instead our ability to change that trait. And this is what I think the hero's journey is born out of, a representation of the pinnacle value of humans. Our ability to grow, to adapt. But growth isn't easy, and 9 times out of 10, there has to be some challenge or obstacle that forces us to transform. Because otherwise, comfort, fear, or the ego will dictate what we do. And so, the initial resistance to this change, an indication of how we should respond, is mapped out in these stories, which act kind of like guides that we can intuitively understand and learn from. If this is true, then the next question I have to try to answer is, why do stories always center around a goal? Why is there treasure? The cliche haha gotcha answer is it's you, it's the person you become as a result of pursuing the goal. But honestly, I don't think that's the whole picture. Neuroscience literature has made it quite clear how drastic of an effect goals have on our mood. The dopaminergic system responds to an anticipatory effect. So when we set goals and make progress toward them, dopamine is released. This happens at each step along the way, not just when we finally achieve the goal. The treasure then, in these myths, was probably born out of an intuitive understanding of the importance of goals. But having a goal is not the same thing as finding meaning. For starters, goals can be superficial, and many times, we can end up pursuing things that are not what we actually want. Secondly, neuroscience literature has also made it clear that unattainable goals can lead to just as much harm as not having a goal at all. So, what is the whole picture? 
An interesting note about the majority of hero myths is that the original goal is usually not what ends up giving the character purpose. So sure, in the beginning, maybe it is some treasure or some overambitious pursuit that gets the character to start their journey. But as they face challenges and grow as a result, the goals change and grow along with them. The treasure, then, can be thought of as the process of finding a purpose, not through a single goal, but rather a series of goals that stem from answering the call to adventure. And so my theory is that because our evolutionary niche is the ability to continually transform cognitively, the hero myth isn't just a story. It's supposed to be a blueprint, a blueprint that shows us how to find a purpose by creating our own niche.